Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Monday, June 17th. Why Illinois Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke's appointment of a judge has received so much blow black. Bla blow back, I'm sorry. Plans for a music festival on Montrose Beach are ruffling the feathers of some locals over fears for a pair of endangered birds. When you're out in the streets, you got to do street games. You got to play that game. So I got caught up in the street game. Cook County Jail detainees learn the basics of beekeeping from a former inmate turned beekeeper. We want to make sure that the users are using their helmets. E-scooters hit Chicago's west side as the city rolls out its pilot program. Influential decision makers shrouded in obscurity, a Northwestern alum's book on how the National Security Council became the White House's warriors. And a new exhibit at the Art Institute showcases 20th century marvels of photography and their impact on the art world. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. More disturbing testimony at the trial of a man accused of murdering a U of I student. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Suspected murderer Brent Christensen repeatedly read web posts with titles like Abduction 101 and Perfect Abduction Fantasy in the weeks leading up to Ying Ying Zhang's disappearance. Zhang was a visiting Chinese scholar at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign when she went missing in June 2017. An FBI examiner detailed Christensen's digital life for jurors in federal court today. The leading defense attorney pointed out that Christensen didn't post anything on the rape fantasy sites and only spent minutes or seconds on them. You'll find more coverage of that capital trial on our website. Another weekend of shootings in Chicago saw Illinois' senior U.S. Senator pressing for federal action on gun control. Legislation requiring broad background checks passed in the House, but Senator Dick Durbin says the Senate's Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, won't call it for a vote. Durbin says McConnell's stance has rendered the Senate a waste of space. He encourages unhappy voters to make that known come the next election. If they're fed up with this do-nothing Congress, if they're fed up with the Congress and can't even pass legislation to make the streets and neighborhoods of America safer, they'll have their day in November of 2020. Durbin's also putting public pressure on President Donald Trump's Food and Drug Administration to combat rising rates of teen vaping by prohibiting bubblegum and other e-cigarette flavors that appeal to young people. Chicago's top cop is back on the job after a minor health scare. Doctors at Rush University Medical Center found a small blood clot in police superintendent Eddie Johnson's lung on Friday during his annual stress test. Johnson was released from Rush this afternoon. A CPD spokesman says Johnson was going to his office to meet with command staff. The superintendent sent word of thanks to doctors, nurses and other well-wishers. Johnson and his son, who is also a Chicago policeman, will receive an award from the National Kidney Foundation this fall. The younger Johnson donated a kidney to his father in 2017. Chicago's only Republican state legislator is stepping down. Representative Mike McAuliffe says after 23 years in the Illinois House, he wants to spend more time with his young children. McAuliffe will get to help choose his replacement, at least until next year's election. Democrats are already eyeing the northwest side seat. As for the weather, foggy tonight with a low around 56. Then tomorrow, more fog in the morning than partly sunny and a high near 77 degrees, finally. Now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. Illinois Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke has made waves in the last week. She selected Kara Smith, who is a longtime policy advisor to Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart, to be a Cook County judge in the seventh subcircuit. But some community activists from the west side say the vacated seat should have gone to an African American. It prompted Burke to issue a rare public statement saying, quote, Cara Lefevre Smith was found qualified by the Chicago Bar Association and highly qualified by my Judicial Screening Committee. Six Supreme Court justices voted to appoint Cara Lefevre Smith to the 7th Judicial Cook County Subcircuit. Having qualified judges is in the best interest of public safety and promotes confidence in the justice system. Justice Burke is married to indicted Chicago Alderman Ed Burke. 
So why such a controversy surrounding this move? Joining us to examine it are Kevin Ford, the chair of Justice Ann Burke's Judicial Selection Committee, David Erickson, a former Illinois appellate court justice and now the director of the Trial Advocacy Program at IIT Kent College of Law, David Melton, attorney and the former executive director of Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, now known as Reform for Illinois, and Gerard Williams, president of the Cook County Bar Association, a leading organization for black attorneys. Thank you all for being here. Uh, starting with you, Kevin <coughs> Ford, uh, a seat comes open in the middle of a judge's term. Explain the process that Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke used to fill this seat. Well, when a seat opens, it's only for that, uh, that interim period between elections. Uh, the process that Justice Burke uses is when there's a vacancy and it's her responsibility to make a recommendation to the full court that makes the appointment. Uh, an individual judge doesn't make an appointment. Uh, what, uh, uh, in that situation uh, where there is a vacancy that, that under uh, Justice Burke's responsibility, uh, uh, she causes a, an announcement uh, on the Supreme Court, Court's website, invites applicants who are interested in, in this interim position to apply. Uh, there's a time period, of course. When that time period closes, the applications are gathered, the committee meets, the committee is made up of 12 people, eight And lawyers. you had this committee, who, so yeah, tell me who's on I, this committee. Uh, I currently am, am the chairman. Uh, Justice, former Justice Ben Miller, a Republican from Springfield, was the chairman for many years. Uh, the last year or so, I've been the chairman. Uh, the committee is, there are uh, four people uh, from uh, uh, academia. Uh, 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 there are uh, two retired appellate court judges on the committee, uh, one a law school dean, uh, former law school dean, two past presidents of the Chicago Bar Association, and then four non-lawyers. Mr. Erickson, does this sound like a process that would select the best qualified judge? Yes, and, and, and I think the process has shown that it has, the appointment process has. The judge, it's the closest thing we have had to merit selection. Um, the process is different though for county-wide vacancies and then, as we have here, a sub-circuit vacancy. But in either case, the vacancy, as Mr. Ford just said, only holds till the next election. So in a so way- So Ms. Smith will have to run to retain her seat. And anyone in that sub-circuit can run against her. David Melton, uh, does this does a screening committee like the one Mr. Ford described take the politics out of these selections? Well, you can never take the politics entirely out of the selections. That's inherent in the process in any judicial selection process. But it does uh, it does minimize, I would say, the uh, the bad appointments where a political insider is appointed by a friend on the court, um, because the point of having a screening committee, which we uh, Every form for Illinois and also Chicago Council of Lawyers have recommended to the, in the past to Supreme Court justices uh, is that you have a group of very qualified, eminent people looking at the qualifications of these people and screening out people who aren't really qualified to be a judge uh, and then making judgments about uh, who seems to be best suited personality-wise and knowledge-wise, experience-wise. And, and this is the process ostensibly that Justice Burke used. Uh, Mr. Williams, do you echo the concerns yeah. of some of the West Side uh, pastors and community members that the vacated seat was an African-American judge, it should have been um, a, a point, an African-American judge should have been appointed to replace her? The most qualified candidate should have been appointed to that position. However, when you talk about the qualifications of a judge, diversity does matter, particularly in a sub-circuit seat that was created for the very purpose of increasing diversity. It was mentioned earlier that there are members of, uh, former members of the Chicago Bar Association on this screening committee. And the Chicago Bar Association, as we know from the statement, does screen judicial applicants. However, there's another organization that also screens judicial applicants that the Cook County Bar Association is a part of and was a founding member of the Alliance of Bar Associations. And one of the specific factors that the Alliance takes into consideration is the candidate's sensitivity to diversity and bias. So that is an, an important factor in choosing the most qualified candidate. Kevin Ford, is, is there a diversity problem on the bench in Cook County? I don't think so. Uh, and, I, and, and to respond, to, uh, to elaborate on Mr. Williams's uh, suggestion, this committee, uh, and I think it takes politics virtually completely out of the process, this committee is very sensitive to the needs of the various communities. Uh, and th that was one of the strongest 
uh, uh, virtues of the candidate that was ultimately selected. Uh, her career, uh, uh, in, in the last few years of her career, devoted almost entirely to improving the criminal justice system to the benefit of, of minorities in particular, poor in general, minorities in particular. So uh, Mr. Williams is absolutely on point, but that is so something So these are that considerations we're, that we're your committee very, goes very, through. very, very sensitive to that issue. And, and it goes without saying that Alderman Ed Burke had huge influence in slating judges to run for these seats. Does he have any influence on this committee? None. And, uh, and I, I've told you the people that are on it. And, and, and None of them I'm, are Ed Burke. If you were not through the names, you would know that that they're uh, uh, not not, su not uh, subject to influence. Mr. Erickson, mm -hmm. you were appointed to one of these seats, but you also ran um, to retain your seat. Can you tell us about the process of trying to get slated by the Cook County Democratic Party? Slating, it depends on the slating that you're going for. If you, when I was going for slating, it was for the appellate court. So I had to go to the slating committee of the Democratic Party of all of the committeemen from the suburbs and the city, okay? Um, you present your credentials, all of the candidates do, and then there's a vote taken and, and, um, by that committee. So it's Do they different. want you to donate to the Democratic Party? If, if you're slated, every slated countywide seat, and this isn't a countywide seat, so I don't even know if these guys in, in the sub-circuits are going to have to donate money back. So $40,000 for to back to from your campaign fund back to the Democratic Party to cover the costs of their printings, the mailers that come out, the, the people on the street, the signs, all, the, the newspaper advertisements, all those things go into a general fund from the Democratic Party. Now in the sub-circuit it's a bit different, but in the sub-circuit I think um, money is, is, is big an in influence today and I, I would disagree with Mr. Melton. I think politics is more infused into the sub-circuits than it is countywide. And, and we should clarify, so the sub, there are 15 sub-circuits. Right. When you're running in a sub-circuit, you're just running in that district, not countywide. Of That's the hundreds correct. of judges that there are countywide, there are 15 of these sub-circuits. Dave Melton, does this process uh, concern you? Uh, it doesn't concern me. Uh, we did have concerns when the sub-circuits, particularly the Shore Council, when the sub-circuits were first adopted. Our concern is basically that because you're drawing from a smaller pool of people, you do not necessarily, you're reducing the quality of your top candidates. Uh, and that's always been concerned with sub-circuits. On the other hand, this is a case of two good principles coming into conflict and you have to reconcile the two. Uh, so getting the best qualified judge has always been our top priority at the council. However, Diversity is also a critical factor on the bench, and we recognize that. And uh, as Mr. Williams said, the, the, the sub-circuits were created for the purpose of ensuring diversity. Um, in this particular case, I think this is a bit of a tempest in the teapot for a couple of reasons. However, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Ford has said, I think this candidate uh, uh, satisfies some of those concerns, even though she's not African-American, she's white, but she still lives in the sub-circuit, I believe, in Florida. She does Parks. have political connections to, to Sheriff Tom Dart and uh, to Lisa Madigan. Um, Mr. Williams, how, how does the Cook County Bar Association uh, increase diversity on the bench? What, or can, they, can, they, can they help uh, minority uh, applicants run for the bench? Absolutely. Uh, but first, uh, let me just say with regard to candidates coming out of the sub-circuit, my perspective would be that the sub-circuits are permitting more top candidates to be identified who may not have had the opportunity to run countywide, those particularly being minority candidates who could potentially be top candidates if they had uh, the access to be able uh, to run a countywide race. With regard to your question, with uh, regard to how the Cook County Bar Association promotes diversity, the one thing that we do is to create the space for those candidates who are from the sub-circuit communities to be able to interact with judges and learn about the very difficult process of running for judge. Also, as I said, we are also a founding member of the Alliance and we're involved in the judicial screening process and we encourage young minority attorneys who think they may want to become a judge to become very active in that process because it allows them to identify what the Bar Association and what the Bar in general identifies as a good candidate for judge and then they can tailor their career to help them develop those skills. All right, so I have to get to the question that's the elephant in the room. Given Alderman Ed Burks, criminal indictment, federal criminal indictment, does it cast a cloud over Justice Ann Burke uh, and her public service? 
Uh, I don't believe in visiting the sins of the husband on the wife. At the same time, they, they jointly threw a fundraiser they at their house for, 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 for Tony Preckwinkle. Preckwinkle. Ms. Preckwinkle said that it was Ann Burke that threw that fundraiser. Does that give anybody concern? That created a little concern in the mayor's race uh, because Ann Burke could not permissibly uh, conduct that fundraiser under the Judicial Code of Ethics. However, she said that uh, Ms. Brackwinkle, I think it, she said that misspoken and the, the written invitation, we looked into that, the written invitation actually had, had Ed Burke's name on and it. There, and there, it had Ed Burke's name and there was an inquiry by a judicial review panel which Correct. did clear uh, Justice Burke. Uh, you wanted to get in, Kevin Ford? I, I was just going to say it. Uh, None of that ha ha has had any influence whatsoever in the committee that that uh, uh, that that we're talking about here. <clears throat> and and she she also could be up to become the next uh, uh, chief justice of the state supreme court. <clears throat> does does this cast a cloud over that? No, because it's done by rotation, and she'll sit and then another justice will sit, and they alternate between Cook County judges and the downstate judges. So this year, right now, we have a downstate judge, then we have a Cook County judge. Next time around, on the basis of if Ann Burke becomes, Justice Burke becomes the chief judge, the next chief judge would come from downstate or outside Cook County, then the next chief judge would move up into there. And right now, um, to, to point out how far I think it's been since just 92, and the, the coming in of the alliance, both can two of the major candidates for Supreme Court seat right now is Justice Neville to fill Justice Freeman's seat, who was one time was president and one of the founders of the Alliance Bar Association, and, and the other one is, is Judge Justice Nate House, who also is incredibly active in the Cook County Bar during his time, as was his sister, who was one of your predecessors, I believe. I just, well, I, I just, so that's all but there. The, but the consensus it's, here is that that she shouldn't be held accountable for the sins of her husband or the uh, alleged sins of her husband. Even though they have been politically, they, they have been they've, a team politically, they've been a team. but I don't think that she should be uh, smeared with uh, any wrongdoing on his part necessarily. And, uh, you know, it's a bigger issue though about recusal standards at the Supreme Court. That's a different, broader issue on which the Illinois Supreme Court has uh, looked into the issue, but not. So uh, whether she'd have to recuse herself from s things that might well, somehow involve her husband? Right now, those decisions at the Illinois Supreme Court, as I understand it, are left to the individual ju justice to decide, much as they are at the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Kevin thank Ford, you, you. Uh, Justice Dave Erickson, Dave Melton, and Gerard Williams, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there is more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city for the free and open exchange of ideas. The City Club of Chicago. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, plans for a Montrose Beach Music Festival gets pushed back over concerns for a pair of endangered birds. Cook County Jail detainees are harvesting vegetables, flowers, herbs, and now honey on the jail's two-acre urban farm. Dockless e-scooters arrive in Chicago as the city launches its pilot program, but will riders stay safe? and famous 20th century photographs now up at the Art Institute. But first, the National Security Council, it is an integral part of U.S. foreign policy, despite the fact that most Americans know little about what it actually does. In a new book, author John Gans traces what he calls the unprecedented evolution of a powerful and opinionated institution at the heart of government. The book is called White House Warriors, How the National Security Council Transformed the American Way of War. And author John Gans joins us now. He's Director of Communications and Research at the University of Pennsylvania's Global Policy Institute and is a former advisor and chief speechwriter at the Pentagon. Gans received his bachelor's degree from Northwestern University and recently spoke at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Good to be here. Thanks okay, so, so a primer, John Gans, what exactly is the National Security Council? 
Council? Well, it's a good question, and uh, it's, not an, it's not an uncomplicated one, but the National Security Council was created after World War II because um, Franklin Roosevelt, among other things, winning World War II, did it pretty much on his own. And most of government said, we've got to get smarter people in the room and a lot more people in the room to help make these big decisions about war. So they created a council that included all the big names in national security, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. But they also created a staff to basically make sure all those big people show up in a room on time, know what they're going to talk about, make decisions, and minutes are kept. And so this little staff has grown in power from a few secretarial workers in the 1940s to being almost three or 400 people today in government who serve at the whim of John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, and President Trump. And in, in, in the foreign policy realm, you have the sometimes competing missions of the State Department and the Department of Defense. So where does the NSC advisor fit into this continuum? Well, they sort of sit at the middle of it, um, but they also they are, they're there to serve the president, right? And so generally speaking, um, they try to get the president ready to make decisions. They work to make sure those decisions are at least as thought through as they can be. And then they work to get them implemented. So they're there basically um, fighting for the president's interest, but also their own. They have opinions. These are ambitious, smart, opinionated people. Um, and I look at staffers in the book from President Truman all the way to President Trump. And these are not sort of uh, people without uh, ambitions and opinions, and they make their voices, their own voices known. Their opinions are very influential too. As you write in the book, sometimes they have more influence than military commanders in the field. How did they become so influential to the president's foreign policy decision making? Well, so it's basically uh, an outgrowth of three things. First, the president uh, became more responsible and was empowered. So uh, presidents throughout history, especially since uh, Watergate, have gotten more powerful. The second thing is, is the government got bigger and a little bit more bureaucratic. So the military has gotten a little bit more bureaucratic. The State Department has grown a little bit more sclerotic. They're not as effective as maybe they could be on paper. And the third thing is, is that the, uh, the, the nation's interests grew more complicated and more global. And so as a result of um, those sort of three factors, there was an opportunity for the staff to grow and sort of both fight for the president presidency, but also to sort of take an integrated view, somebody who was looking at all the factors and make advice based on that global view. And you also write that one of the original architects of the NSC, James Forrestal, mm -hmm. came to regret mm -hmm. uh, the creation of the agency. Why is that? Well, he was one of those people that said, you know, during World War II, we need to do a better job of getting everybody's advice in the room. But the problem is, is he, he also was the first Secretary of Defense uh, and became the first Secretary of Defense. And he saw that the White House immediately grabbed onto the council and the staff to try and make them fight for the president. And his first piece of advice was, hey, why don't we actually put the staff at the Pentagon? They can sit here, we just built mm. this big new building. We have lots of office space. And the White House said, no, we're going to put them at the old executive office building, which is right next to the White House. And so Forrestal began to see that it was an avenue for increasing presidential power. And his son went actually on to fight and work for John F. Kennedy on the National Security Council staff. And you write about his son, Michael Forrestal. Yeah. Tell us about why he was someone you wanted to highlight in this book. So Michael Forrestal is, is sort of was a, is a perfect uh, uh, example of the Kennedy approach to foreign policy. And Michael Forrestal was sort of raised by the establishment. His father was Secretary of Defense. Uh, and then uh, after his father died, uh, he was raised by sort of one of the big Truman advisors, uh, a gentleman named Avril Harriman, who was ambassador and, and things along those lines. And Michael Forrestal, you know, had the pedigree, the Ivy League degree to be one of the best and the brightest. And he was a friend of John Kennedy's. And, and John Kennedy said, hey, you got to come down here and work here in government. Mm -hmm. And Ke Forrestal said, well, to do what? What do you want me to do? He said, just come down and we'll figure it out. And when he got down there, when he got to the White House and was told he was joining the National Security Council staff, Forrestal said, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to work on Asia. And Kennedy said, I want you to work on Asia. And Forrestal said, I don't know anything about Asia. And Kennedy said, well, that's perfect. We need somebody with a fresh set of eyes. And of course, Michael Forrestal was given the Vietnam. Uh, that was one of his projects. And he pushed and pushed and pushed America deeper into Vietnam, including working with his like sort of adopted father, Avril Harriman, who was in the State Department, to help push for a coup against uh, President Diem, the South Vietnamese president, which you know Kennedy approved based on basically Forrestal's own recommendation without the word of the National Security Advisor, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And it was essentially the NSC that, that really sort of provided some of the more influential policy as the quagmire in Vietnam grew. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and, and so tell us about um, their role in Vietnam and, and the fact that they, they kind of knew at an early stage that this was kind of an impossible quagmire. Yeah, so Forrestal was very interesting. He was one of those, the most forceful people pushing the United States deeper into war with coup and everything else. But he slowly grew disillusioned. Um, but what you find is, is that the presidents eventually always find somebody who's willing to play, provide a more hawkish view, uh, especially on the National Security Council in, in, during Vietnam. And whether it's Kennedy, Johnson and then Nixon. Uh, Nixon used the NSC, then run by Henry Kissinger, to basically help try to win the war single-handedly. Um, and they basically pursued a very aggressive policy in Vietnam with total, um, I think, um, use of the NSC, whereas the State Department and the DOD were much more opposed to a more strong policy. The NSC was the ones that helped develop the ideas that helped Nixon escalate the war in 1969. So it seems like that's a consistent theme because you also write about a semi-obscure NSC staff member that was responsible for the surge in Iraq yeah. under George W. Bush. Yeah, I mean, it, any military escalation since the Truman administration has basically been uh, forced or at least um, pushed by the National Security Council staff. And the, the, uh, the surge in Iraq in 2007, the decision that George W. Bush made to send 30,000 and more troops to Iraq at a time where nobody thought going sending more troops to Iraq was a good idea. The Secretary of State, Condi Rice, was opposed. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs was opposed. The military commanders in Iraq were opposed. The Secretary of Defense was unsure. The American people had just voted in an election in 2006 to basically send a message that the war was going badly. And Megan O'Sullivan, who was a young woman in her 30s who had worked in Baghdad as a civilian and a few other National Security Council staffers came up with the surge. They helped develop it, promote it, got the President on board, and he pushed for it, even though there was nobody uh, on his cabinet who was in favor of it other than probably Vice President Cheney. And for that reason, he called the National Security Council his personal band of warriors, which is where the title White House Warriors came from. And then you have the Trump administration and NSC advisor John Bolton. How, 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 is, how would you characterize the National Security Council in the Trump administration? Well, it's very interesting. The, the National Security Council probably nowhere else in Washington has there been the, the, has the conflict between the sort of regular way of governing and the irregular President Donald Trump come into, come into greater conflict than on the National Security Council. Because mostly government has been running National Security Council, National Security the same way for, de for generations. And so he's come in and really sort of been a real test to the system. Um, and he finally found a National Security Advisor, John Bolton, who was willing to sort of help him try to do what he wanted to do. The problem is, is that John Bolton had to basically break the system in order to get Donald Trump what he wants. So he's shrunk the system, shrunk the meetings, canceled meetings, and basically started making just parliamentary policy with just him and the president and a few others alone in the Oval Office. And you talk about the fact that these people are kind of unknown to the broader public, and yet they're so influential mm -hmm. in policy making. Is this the deep state that President Trump and conservative media like to rail on about? Well, it looks like one, right? I mean, the problem is, is that, you know, as I make very clear, they wouldn't have to fight this hard and this aggressively in Washington if there was a deep state. There's no organized conspiracy in Washington to change policy. But there are very ambitious, very opinionated, very driven people in Washington who work under the cover of national security to get a lot of what they want done. And for that reason, I actually think that the National Security Council can give some suggestion of a deep state and under undermine trust in government, which is why my conclusion is the book that these White House warriors need to be known to the people because they've helped change the world we live in and helped change uh, the way of war, uh, America's way of war. And because they sort of represent to some people a deep state, they, they threaten the American way of life, which is a representative democracy that we elect the best people to Washington to go serve us. And then we trust them. Uh, and at a time where trust in government is shrinking, it's time to open up the National Security Council. And as you say, they're not necessarily accountable to other branches of government. They're not accountable to Congress. No. Uh, it's fascinating uh, insight into a part of government that we just don't know much about, but has really affected our lives. John Gans, congratulations on the book, and thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me on. And again, the new book from John Gans is White House Warriors, How the National Security Council Transformed the American Way of War. You can read an excerpt on our website. And there's more Chicago Tonight ahead, so don't go away. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe.
to party or not to party? That is the question facing several groups near the lakefront on the city's north side. Promoters are planning a big music festival on Montrose Beach called Man Beyond the Beach. But the event has drawn opposition from a few local organizations who are concerned about traffic, beach access, and some endangered birds that have recently made the beach home. So will all parties involved come to some kind of harmonious agreement? We'll ask them. Joining us are Carl Giametti, president of the Chicago Ornithological Society, Paul Fehrenbacher, a member of the Montrose Lakefront Coalition, who also has a business in the Montrose Recreational Area, and Jerry Michelson, co-founder of Jam Productions, who along with REACT Presents is promoting the Mambi on the Beach Festival. Welcome all of you to Chicago tonight. You, uh, first, you. Mr. Michelson, this uh, event was held on the south side at Oakwood Beach for a few years. Why is it moving north now? It was held at Oakwood Beach for the first four years, and um, there were four or five reasons that it's moving. First, um, the site is, the Oakwood Beach is not a site conducive for a festival. Second, there's very little parking. Third, very little public transportation. Fourth, um, the fans that come to this show, and it's a very diverse lineup, um, um, said to us, please move it off of Pride Weekend. So it's always been on Pride Weekend. And they said they wanted to attend both days, but they couldn't because they also had to attend Pride events. What is the thrust of the, of the sort of the lineup? The, the, what kind of music? Um, it's all diverse. It, it appeals to every, every demographic, every music fan. Um, it's a very hip pop um, type of lineup. And the, by the way, the fifth reason was um, that they also said we want it closer to our, where we live and most of the fans that buy tickets are from the north side. And there's public transit nearby. Uh, Mr. Um, Giametti, what are your concerns with holding this festival on Montrose Beach? Sure. Uh, Montrose has for many, many decades been one of the premier stopover habitats for migratory birds. Uh, there are about 750 uh, regularly occurring birds in the lower 48 states. Nearly half of them have been spotted at Montrose at some time or the other. However, thanks to a lot of the uh, incredible work by the park district and the stewards and the volunteers improving the habitat there, it's also become incredibly important breeding bird habitat. And uh, that's really indicated by the piping plovers that decided to show up and nest there this year. So and this is an endangered species of it, bird. The Great Lakes piping plover is a federally endangered uh, 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 population of birds. Yes. Mr. Mr. Frambecker, I know you, you echo those concerns about the migratory birds, but are there additional concerns you have about this event? There are additional concerns. So as you mentioned, I wear the hat of the Montrose Lakefront Coalition. I'm also on the board of the Montrose Dog Beach and have a business at Montrose Dog Beach called Mutt Jackson where we have dog washes and a retail space. In addition to the natural areas and the bird sanctuary issues that Carl's uh, speaking about now, other issues include access. So on average, an event in the Montrose Recreational Area has around 3,000 people. I believe, Jerry, yours over the course of two days could have as many as 50,000 people. Uh, secondarily, the issue of sound is something that's being discussed with Jerry and his team. And then the last one is vendors like myself at Mutt Jackson, uh, the owners of the dock, the owners of the park bait shop have concerns that access to our companies will be limited and revenue will be decreased. Okay, so I want to, Jerry, I want to get your, your responses to those concerns. How is your organization addressing those? So. Um, Let's talk about the piping plover. The eggs have been removed, correct? Correct. Um, so that's not an issue at this point. Uh, it is. Uh, in fact, actually, just a few hours ago, uh, we, we've been manning the nest site with uh, volunteers who've given hours of their time ever since they've engaged in uh, mating activity. For example, it's called nest scraping. Um, so do you, is there any way to hold this festival and protect those birds? So I think the best well, example. Are they mating again? They are. They, okay. uh, the male has been observed uh, creating new nests, uh, and they've been engage engaging in courtship behavior. So I think the best example for uh, the difficulty about holding a concert here is actually out in New Jersey, where the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, recently canceled an entire summer slate of concerts due to the Atlantic population of the piping plover nesting on those beaches. The Atlantic piping plover uh, population far exceeds the Great Lakes. They have breeding couple uh, breeding pairs numbering in the hundreds. The Great Lakes piping plover has about 70 breeding pairs, about 60 of which are in, in Michigan. Only about t eight to 10 occur on the West Lake Michigan coast, basically Michigan and Illinois. All right, so, so is there a way to, to do this festival and, and to protect their habitat? Well, yeah, let me ask you the question. First of all, we're, we're, we're I'm a pro 
plover. Pro plover. <laughs> right, pro plover. We do not want to disturb any bird, any habitat, and we go to great lengths to make sure that we're good neighbors. So let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, the nest that was originally there, mm -hmm. that they took the eggs from, was maybe a hundred yards from the dock. Mm -hmm. The dock is the restaurant The restaurant. The restaurant. There. As I understand it, piping, uh, the, the safe way is sound should not be any less than 1,000 meters away. That's 1,100 yards. Mm -hmm. So why is it okay, and I mean no disrespect to the dock, why is it okay that the dock plays music every night where these birds were 100 yards away and it's so you're not saying the okay argument might be a little disingenuous because they do yes. have music at that, at that Every night. place on the so beach. So why didn't bands. they say anything about the dock's music? Well, largely because the decibel level of a dock playing music over a PA system doesn't reach anywhere near the It's 100 right. yards. Mr. Fehrenbacher, is, is it your goal to not have this festival happen, or is there a compromise that you can reach? Uh, so wearing the hat of Matros Dog Beach and as a business owner, I like to try to figure out a way to have events like Mambi uh, in places like the Montrose Recreational Area. The challenge is, is we haven't seen the site plan yet. And so until we really know where the site is, it's difficult to kind of address some of the concerns that our group has. That's a great response now, but the letter that was sent May 31st to Superintendent Kelly was fraught with lies. This is the Park District Superintendent you're saying. So yes, you're saying uh, your yes. organization sent a letter to the Park District Superintendent? Yes, and the first sentence of the letter says to the, to the General Superintendent, well, we just learned about this concert on May 30th. Well, they forgot to put in there that I emailed them on May 9th and asked to have a meeting with them to discuss Mambi on the beach August 23 and 24. So it's really disingenuous to say that, that, that we didn't try. And, and, uh, and to put never, that in the first sentence of the letter to Mr. Kelly was wrong. In my response, Jerry, I don't believe I ever said that you didn't try with the statement that I just but, made. But what missed, uh, you didn't, but the letter, I'm referring to the letter that had a, the first sentence was a complete absolute falsehood. But to Paris's point, we're trying yeah. to work together here, so let's... let's so that, that's good. So, so what is the comfort? Is it, is it holding it on the, the lawn and not the beach? So let me, let me just say this, that we had found out from the Park District, maybe now it's two weeks ago, that the beach is probably going to be underwater due to high lake levels. In so, August, and this festival is in, in late August. Yeah, so we're making plans to move it into the park. Does that help if it's in the park? So you know, obviously any movement away from the beach would help, but the problem is is that the numbers that are being discussed for this concert, you know, exceeding 40,000 people over two days, there's just no realistic way to control that amount of people. You know, these, uh, this population of piping plovers is too valuable to simply risk it. There are dozens and dozens of wonderful places uh, you can get outdoor music in Chicago. There's only one that these piping plovers nested. Uh, and in a, even if the piping plovers weren't there, the habitat has been uh, uh, shaped and restored by so many volunteers over so many decades. Montrose is a difficult place. I, I fully appreciate the difficulty of this situation, but no single user of the beach should irreparably harm any other user's efforts. I, I totally disagree with you. First of all, you're making a broad generalization and a misstatement that the site cannot be properly secured. We did it for Mumford and Sons. We put security right. in the wildlife sanctuary so you're and in Mumford the Mumford and Sons did a concert on Montrose not on the beach, beach, but in the Cricket Hill, and we put security everywhere. And so your statement is not correct. We can secure anything. That's not an issue. M Mr. Fehrenbacher, uh, do you, are you confident that it could be secure? And then what about the point about? Uh, they, they say they would compensate businesses if they lose revenue because of this. In terms of the plovers and security, I'd defer to Carl on that. Uh, it's a conversation that Jerry and I were actually were having before right. today's show is how the businesses can try to work together with Jerry to be made whole in some way, shape, or form. I think no, that, that's correct. No, you're being made whole. But the businesses. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so we had a meeting a week ago mm -hmm. uh, with the Montrose Lakefront Coalition. We addressed every one of their points, but yet they're still not satisfied. It's kind of like uh, unreasonable people to be will clear, never be able to strike a simple, reasonable solution. You still need a permit from the city as well, correct? We have, our, we have a, a, a contract and we'll get all the permits we need. We can't get a permit for the stage until we build the stage. So that's just part of the process. It, so this festival is happening on Montrose Beach. Oh yeah, we've your, got 6,000 tickets sold already. And, and it's your hope, do you feel like there is a compromise if they move it into the park? 
I mean, we haven't seen any plans yet to move it away, so I don't want to speculate on something that I haven't seen. Um, but, you know, pipe and plover eggs are camouflaged. It's hard for someone that is looking for them to find them. You know, if one single person were to get away from security and, and harm these birds, that's a loss that we're simply, you know, don't feel it's uh, a justifiable risk. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you, gentlemen. Jerry Michelson, Carl Giametti, Paul Fehrenbacher. Best of luck. Thank uh, you. I hope you've thank come you. to some kind of resolution, we, whatever it may be, and we'll we follow agree. this. Hopefully. And now from birds to bees. On a two-acre farm at Cook County Jail, detainees grow vegetables, flowers, and herbs, some of which end up in local restaurants and farmers' markets. Now detainees are re raising honeybees thanks to a local beekeeper who's turned his own life around. Chicago Tonight's Evan Garcia visited Cook County Jail to learn more. You know, and if they want to get a job, I'm cool with that. But I wanted to know, man, all that hustle you did on the streets, man, you could just flip that straight into a business, bro. Absolutely. Beekeeper Thad Smith is at Cook County Jail, introducing himself to a few inmates. Gentlemen, I'm here to really teach you about bees, teach you about agriculture, but I'm also here to teach you about entrepreneurship. Because, I, again, I don't care about your background. I don't care what you did. That ain't my business. I don't care. Smith is at the jail to bring beekeeping to the Cook County Sheriff's Urban Farming Initiative, started in 1993. Right here. Come here, I'll show you. The program is a rehabilitative program for detainees who are um, nonviolent. And so they come out here and they learn um, on site hands on horticulture as well as job skills and job training. Um, the hope is that when they get out, we are able to place them in employment. Over here, that's a good opportunity to know how to, the right way to plant, you know, tomatoes, hot peppers, and all that. So it's going to be a good chance to learn everything about gardening. This right here is our biggest obstacle, fellas. Smith can empathize with the group. He served time here. About eight years ago, I was homeless. And I don't know if anybody's been homeless. And again, I don't care, but when you, it's the street, the same thing, it's the street, bro. So when you're out in the streets, you gotta do street games. You gotta play that game. So I got caught up in the street game. Four years ago, I met Smith at the North Lawndale Employment Network. The nonprofit helped him discover a passion for beekeeping. When we put this in, this was blank, you know? See if I can get a blank frame for you. But if you notice, look at all that nice white comb and then it's glistening inside, that's all nectar. They are doing a really excellent job here. Wow. Okay, here's a queen right here. You can tell it's a queen. She's nice and black. She's long. What she's doing right now is looking for uh, cells to lay eggs in. The ones that are open, she will lay an egg in. At the time, Smith had just started Westside Bee Boys, a company he still runs that manages beehives and sells beekeeping products. I'm not even gonna crack them open. Yeah, you can open them and just look at them. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, well, these are nice looking bees, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Now Smith's returning to jail, but as a beekeeper, he's installing two starter hives. Each box contains a queen and about 10,000 bees. All right, uh, we're gonna walk where we're gonna put them. We're gonna open it up really nice, Wonderful. small, slow. All right, gentlemen, come on over. We're not gonna dig into it today. We're gonna be a little bit calm because it's a little cool. Much like some humans, Smith says bees aren't fond of windy, rainy, or cold weather. We wanna be a little slow, wanna take it nice and easy so that nobody gets a little upset. Mm. That's honey right there, that's done. They seal it, right? Yeah, they seal it. It's like Tupperware, as I like to call it. All right, so I'm gonna put this back in so that we can let them stay warm because it is a cold day. After a bit of action, it's time to leave them be. Okay, yeah, so what I would need everybody to do is step back. I, no, seriously, I need everybody to step back. Smith says these Italian honeybees tend to be a more docile and productive type of bee, perfect for beginners. A flower's scent and bright colors are what attract bees, facilitating pollination. You guys don't smell like flowers, I guarantee it. <laughs> and you don't have on the colors of flowers, so they're pretty much not gonna bother you. The program at Cook County Jail produces more than harvests of vegetables, flowers, and eventually honey. It also provides serenity in a stressful environment. You know, being here, I've, I've had a bad temper my whole life. Okay. 
but since doing this gardening, I've been more laid back, more relaxed, uh, and I'm real, you know, real itchy to learn more about this because it's showing me things about myself that I never even knew. Smith knows that feeling. He said how it calmed his mind, it calmed his nerves. I, man, I, 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 you know, I almost went into tears because I, I know what that is. I know how that feels. I know that shift. And when you have that shift, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And it puts you on a different path that you didn't know you could go before. And I believe his journey, man, he's going to have a really, really great journey if he stays on that path. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Evan Garcia. Smith said he plans to return to Cook County Jail this summer to transfer the bees to larger hives. Ready or not, the scooters have arrived. The city of Chicago launched its e-scooter pilot program this weekend on parts of the west side, featuring 2,500 scooters from 10 different companies. The program will serve as a test to see if scooters are a viable transportation option for Chicago residents. Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Commissioner Rosa Escareno says scooters could improve Chicagoans' commutes. It's a mixed bag, but certain, for us, we think the launch actually worked out really well. Uh, the requirement for all companies was to have all their fleet on the road uh, on day one, and all the companies uh, were able to push out their products and introduce them to the communities throughout the city. Anytime that you can uh, broaden opportunities and options for our residents to get around and to connect last mile, first mile, for us is really important. But the scooters have also raised serious safety and congestion concerns in cities across the country. Joining us to discuss the rollout are Kate Lowe, a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago's Department of Urban Planning and Policy, and Linda Lopez, a reporter for the transportation site Streets Blog Chicago. Welcome, both of you. Hi. Everybody yeah. has an opinion on these scooters. Yeah. Kate Lowe, how did the rollout go this weekend? Well. It's hard to fully assess. We don't have the full picture. Luckily, one of the features of the pilot is that the companies are supposed to share data with the city. So that will help transparency and get more of an update. There's a lot of strong feelings on social media. Um, there's a lot of excitement. They seem novel and fun, but already reports of little mishaps. And sometimes scooters can be a nuisance for others. A nuisance on the sidewalk is a real mobility impairment. So when thinking about the downsides, we have to think about how they affect different populations, including those with visual impairments, other mobility impairments. Linda Lopez, uh, have you heard any anecdotal stories this weekend of problems, hiccups, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've like, I asked my social media followers, what, what did you all think about the, like, the scooter pilot this weekend? And I've heard people saying, well, I've ever seen a lot uh, like strewn on the sidewalk in Filson and I mean uh, other people say that they're like really excited about them but I've already heard I think the main concern I've heard so far is how they're gonna uh, like block sidewalk access or block cyclists in the bike lane and already places where you have very little room alongside cars so I think those are some of the main things that I've been and, hearing. And these are free floating meaning you can dock them wherever so that are they just strewn out uh, across sidewalks and driveways? Or so the pilot has some good features. It's asking that vendors require a photo uploaded to the app to show it parked appropriately. And they should be parked the same way that bicycles are parked, which is out of the public way, near signs, near bike racks. Um, but per Linda's comments, there's been incidents where they're not parked that way. And there's lots of photos from Chicago and elsewhere of uh, parking gone wrong. Um, but one thing that I think could have done, been a little more balanced is I was a little disappointed to see where the rollout of the events were. The only three uh, vendor events I knew of to introduce scooters were West Loop and Wicker Park. Um, and that's kind of playing to a stereotype of who rides scooters. Sure. Certainly more affluent parts of the city yes. or young professionals. Linda Lopez, what about the boundaries of where these are allowed to go? Why did the city choose kind of a narrow boundary? Uh, you can't go east of Halstead, and we have a map to show, to show the boundaries here. Can't go east of Halstead. You can go all the way west to Harlem or Austin. Uh, can't go north of Irving Park or south of Pershing. What about those boundaries? Yeah, and I think some people are saying, well, maybe scooters can help fill the gaps and like transportation access to other parts of the city that might not have, um, like as 
accessible like, transit forms, like whether buses or trains. So I think scooters are in areas where we might not historically seen like really good transportation access. So I think I think some people are asking, well, can scooters help fill that gap? Can um, they lead to more equity in certain parts of the, the city? And I think that's a really open question whether they c like that's a lot of responsibility for one mobility form. If the pilot goes well, will it be allowed in more areas of the city, do you believe? Uh, that would be a question up to this administration. And, and the pilot was initially announced under the formal former mayoral administration. But I, I'm optimistic that there'll be some more dialogue and reflection. And while scooters are new, innovative, and as we said, everyone has a strong opinion, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of the bigger transportation picture, which is more than 700,000 bus trips um, in June of 2018. So how do scooters fit into this bigger picture and making sure we address our declining CTA ridership? How do they fit into the picture of safety when you have them on the street with cars, you have obstacles like uh, pedestrians, potholes? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we need to think like really broadly, holistically about our street infrastructure. How in general do we want to make sure all mobility forms are safe? And that's really thinking of how we get more cars off the road. How do we create more bus only lanes? How do we create more bus lanes, um, more bike lanes? And I think that goes beyond like scooters, but how scooters fit into in general, like making sure mo mo more mobility forms are safe on the road. Okay, well, how have other cities fared with the safety question? There is not a lot of data. Uh, Austin's public health department in partnership with the Center for Disease Control put out a report and they found in their observed scooter injuries, one third were on the first trip. Um, wow. and, and they found a lot of serious injuries, but we don't have a lot of data. I, ironically, could scooters be part of readdressing the safety conversation in transportation? How do we make street safe for all modes of transportation. And the scooter companies are indemnified. I mean, you're liable if you get hurt on a scooter. They say watch out for potholes. And so that covers them. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of that? Uh, what, do you, what do you think of the, 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 the issue of safety and cars and trucks and buses? How, how, how do you avoid that? Yeah, I think it's like I think it's it goes beyond just like well we're like talking about access so they're in all these parts of the city but I think it has to, like what kind of education are riders getting like you know when you drive a car you have to go through all these weeks of like driving lessons in school so we should I think we should really think about when we introduce new mobility forms how are we making sure people are safe making and sure there's a safety yeah, course or some kind exactly. of exactly um, take me through the process Kate Lowe I decide I want to travel somewhere by scooter how do I do it and do I need a smartphone. So uh, again, the pilot program has some good provisions in it, which is there's supposed to be a way to work via text or calling someone. I haven't walked through that process as a user myself, um, but there is supposed to be a mechanism for cash users and non-smartphone users. But most people are gonna download the app, pay for the scooter, unlock it via the app. You use your foot to start, throttle on the handlebars. And then you go. And, and, and Linda Lopez, why did the city choose 10 vendors to do this pilot program? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think potentially to see, well, what are the best vendors for, um, like, if we actually want to extend, like, after October 15, which ones, which ones do you think, what, which ones do you think worked well, like, in order, if we want to implement this citywide, so maybe, like, trying to get as much feedback as possible from as many vendors as possible, which I think some may say is a detriment to have so much, like... Might be hard for the consumer exactly. to choose which one to go with, but maybe the competition will uh, make vendors get their program uh, on par or up to par. So it's October 15th is the end mm -hmm. of the pilot. Yes. All right, well, well, we'll have to keep watching. Kate Lowe, Linda Lopez, thank you both very thank much. You. Thank you. And you can check out a poll on our website to weigh in on whether or not you think e-scooters are a good idea for Chicago. And if you scoot over to the Art Institute, there's a new exhibit that explores a collection of famous pictures from the 20th century. Here's a short look at the long impact of photography in art. Photography has long been used to make images of iconic works of art. Sometimes the photographs themselves become icons. What you're seeing here is this iconic view that Margaret Bourke White saw out of the 61st floor of the newly built Chrysler building. She was hired to photograph it as it was going up and she fell in love with it. She particularly fell in love with these gargoyles which were themselves patterned after hood ornaments on Chrysler cars. 
Other photos feature experiments in light, early examples of advertising in photography, and documentary studies of people of different classes. This show takes as its subject photographs that have become famous, have become iconic, because they are photographs, because they engage in a particular vocabulary and aesthetics and technique that is specific to photography. So we're looking at, in this show, iconic photographs that have been stamped as such by new voices of authority of museums, curators, editors, publishers, and circulated to become known as key works in the history of photography. A lot of visitors will bring to this show some knowledge of the pictures. They'll see them, they'll have recognition. Uh, I know that one, I remember this one, they're famous. What we want them to take away is how did they get famous? What are the qualities of these images and these specific prints uh, and their histories that have made them iconic? The show is called Iconic, Photographs from the Robin and Sandy Stewart Collection. It is part of an ongoing series of photography explorations at the Art Institute and runs through August 4th. One note before we go tonight, today marks the first anniversary of the death of our beloved colleague, Elizabeth Brackett. She was, of course, a consummate journalist. She covered the trials of two governors and wrote a book about Rod Blagojevich. She reported and produced an in-depth documentary on then U.S. Senate candidate Barack Obama. You can see that on our website. She was curious about everything, but Elizabeth specialized in political and environmental reporting. She also won multiple world championships as a triathlete and was training on the lakefront on her bike when she died. There's now a bench dedicated to Elizabeth at Promontory Point near her home on the south side, where she trained both in the water and on the bike path a meaningful way to remember a great friend. And that's our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. And for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.